and welcome to the Knowledge Show powered by Knowledgecape. My name is Ahmad Zaman and I will be your moderator for today's discussion. For everyone who is new to this show, the Knowledge Show is an initiative by Knowledgecape to bring leaders from across geographies and sectors to talk about talent development, the industry and people in general. Today's show is going to be really exciting as it is around the topic of getting organizations ready for the workforce of the future. And without further ado, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you our guest. Our special guest for today is Rituraj Sir. Rituraj Sir is the Vice President and Head of Learning and Development at Lupin Limited. Lupin is one of the top three leading pharma players employing more than 15,000 people worldwide with operations in more than 100 countries. With 25 years of world-class experience spanning different locations and industries in India, Rituraj joined Lupin Limited in 2006. Rituraj has attended several other advanced management programs from premier business management schools. Rituraj is a trained facilitator and certified trainer. Using his business insights coupled with HR exposure, he has done extensive work in performance development, leadership development, and organization development across sectors with large MNCs and Indian organization. Thank you so much, Rutraj, for joining us for this show. It's an absolute privilege for us to be hosting you uh, on this program. My pleasure. Thanks a lot. I mean, who better than you to have spoken on the topic of getting organizations ready, right? With your uh, prolific uh, profile here. And along with uh, Rituraj, we have Rajiv Jairaman. Rajiv is the founder and CEO at Nolscape. Under his leadership, Nolscape has delivered incredible business outcomes for 370 plus leading organizations across 25 countries and has won numerous industry awards. A TEDx speaker, Rajiv has keen interest in the psychology of learning, design, and technology. He is the author of Cleaning the Digital Blur, a definitive guide to helping organizations and leaders transform at the, at the speed of digital and the co-author of Transformational Leadership in Banking. Thank you so much, Rajiv, for joining us for this show. Yeah, great to be here and great to be sharing this uh, uh, virtual stage with uh, Rituraj. I've had the pleasure and opportunity to be in an event uh, together with him. And I've walked away every single time with great insight. So looking forward to this. Since uh, Rituraj, you are new to the show and because we at Norske follow this philosophy that, you know, learning is uh, not insightful or retentive if, if it's not fun, right? And also from the point of view that we would like both of you know to to get to know each other better. So we have this rapid fire question round, which is oh. word association, <laughs> right? So uh, uh, we will start with Rajiv. So uh, 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 whatever is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear that word, you have to tell us without any filters so that you, we, we get to know you better, right? So, so we'll uh, start with- a word or, or, or a description of what comes to our mind? Yeah, it could be anything. You have okay, to explain sorry. why that comes to your mind. Okay. Okay. So Rajiv, we'll start with you because you are an in-house guest. So you sure. don't get the advantage there, right? So um, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the word milestone? When I hear the word milestone, great project management comes to mind. Um, and as they say, without uh, great measurement, uh, you cannot manage anything right? Uh, there's no management without measurement. So, and milestones are great because they give you um, a sense for how far away you are from the goal. And these milestones are to, are to be cherished. And these are small wins that you get and uh, keeps um, you honest to the goal and uh, keeps telling you uh, whether you're on the right track or not. So that's what comes to my mind. Very nice. Influence. When I think of influence, I think of maybe the number one leadership skill that is needed today, right? So uh, in a world where uh, hierarchies are not mattering as much, right? We're becoming flatter. Uh, we're becoming platforms at a business model level where, you know, most of the organization actually is outside the organization. 
right? In which case you don't have formal authority over the people uh, that are doing your work, right? Or are working towards your mission. So uh, in that scenario, I think influence uh, without authority becomes the number one skill. Great. Uh, I have picked up a lot of these uh, uh, words from the trending Twitter hashtag. So okay. just, uh, find a lot of these very interesting. Next word for you, Rajiv, is crisis. Uh, crisis. When I think of crisis, I think of COVID. The last two years, uh, what the world has gone through. Uh, while on the one hand, yes, there was um, a, a lot of gloom and doom. It has also given us a lot of optimism, hope. Uh, there was heroism. There were people who have done extraordinary things in the last two years, uh, looking out for the society, doctors, nurses, um, right? And, and so in a way, uh, like they say, a crisis is also an opportunity, right? It, it really depends on the perspective we take. Nice. The next word for you, Rajiv, is uh, modern. Modern. Yeah. Okay. So when I hear the word modern, I, I somehow I'm getting this uh, word association of temporary. Okay. Uh, because what is considered as modern today, maybe tomorrow is outdated already. That's the speed at which things are moving. Um, so, whereas the classics have remained classics, right? Or maybe the modern tomorrow becomes a classic, but the, the modern, what we identify as modern itself is short-lived. Very interesting take there, Raji. Uh, the last word for you is cricket. Okay. Um, <laughs> You've been watching Asia Cup uh, recently. So the, the one thing that stands out about cricket is innovation, uh, right? So back in the day, you know, from a five-day test match to a one-day international seemed like a big thing at some point in time, you know, how will the game survive to T20s. And, and you see um, in the same team, you've got players who can play all three formats and there are specialists who play only T20s, uh, right? And how the game has evolved. And also the, the amount of digital that has crept into the game, uh, right? So every ball you get, ball-to-ball -ball analytics, what the player is capable of. And with that, I wonder, you know, is there any stra strategic advantage to unlocking a new technique? Because the next day, people are going to analyze it and your technique or, or advantage is already in public, uh, right? So which only says that one needs to constantly keep reinventing, uh, right? Because the format itself is changing. And your tricks are all out there for people to see. So, uh, so innovation is probably the thing that stands out. Wow. Uh, very interesting perspectives there on those uh, trending keywords, Rajiv. Thank you so much. With Thank that, you. we come to uh, an end to your part. We'll now move uh, to Rituraj. And the first word that I have for Rituraj is boycott. Wow. I'm excited with this rapid fire, especially based on the kind of precedence uh, Rajiv has set. Uh, boycott for me means actually, in a way, centering uh, what you are boycotting around, uh, centering yourself around it. So boycott is a very interesting indirect focus that we actually are having on that particular thing. So while it might sound philosophical, I think boycott actually needs to be uh, not really boycott. It needs to be move on. Nice. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Uh, next word for you, Rituraj, is agile. Oh, yeah. Agile uh, is the way to be, actually. Uh, agile is about being responsive. Agile is about being prompt. Agile is about being proactive. Agile is about being big picture connected. Agile is about being actually more than your uh, narrow immediate uh, interest, narrow immediate gains. Agile is about long haul, about long term. Agile is about above and beyond. Agile is uh, what we need to be actually at uh, any given moment in time, whether we are uh, 20 years old or we are 80 years old. Agile is the way to live. All right. The next word for you, Rituraj, is travel. Travel is life. Travel is one of my favorite hobbies and travel actually keeps you up and uh, learning and growing every moment. Travel to you also means actually that you are coming across with things that you have not actually encountered earlier on. So there is a lot of excitement, a lot of adventure, a lot of curiosity, a lot of first time things happening to you in your life. So travel is, of course, the source, the gangotri of all the life that happens to you. Where have you traveled recently? 
some memory. I have recently been to Abu Dhabi for the first time in my life. And wow, okay. what an experience it was. It has been an, uh, such an enriching experience in terms of what a country can do within 15 years. And while we keep discussing, debating as another country, just as an example, not that I'm pessimistic about India at all. India is a land of opportunities, but so much we can learn from every single example. And Abu Dhabi is one such example. I came back very, very rich in that sense. It is the richest city in the world, by the way. Right. Nice. Your next word would be digital. Digital, I mean, uh, I'm uh, really impressed with the kind of words you are actually giving to me. These are all my favorite words. These are the words that, you know, one tends to live by. And there is so much of rework that is happening of each one of us around digital. And therefore, whatever you do, the way you live, the way you work, everything now is a fresh opportunity thanks to digital. The way you are actually making payments or the way you are watching your entertainment or the way you are going about doing learning and development or any work, any work of life, digital has come to become actually the center stage of our existence, of our being. Digital is actually the new learning opportunity for each one of us. It is no longer an option. It is the way to live. Right. Very interesting, uh, Ritraj. Uh, since the idea of this entire segment was fun, the last word for you is fun. <laughs> what is your idea of fun? Being in the moment is fun. The moment in which you are, and if you are one with that moment, and in a manner that you think that is the most important thing that is happening to you at that moment, that is, according to me, fun. When you actually lose track of time, then you actually go with the flow and let your best un uh, unfold. Uh, that is fun. Now, that may be any hour of the day. Great. Uh, with that, we come to that fun segment, uh, Rituraj. And uh, thanks to both of you, Rajiv and Rituraj, for sharing your personal anecdotes so that our viewers and uh, we get to know you better. Now move to the more serious discussions, which is around today's theme, right? So I will, I will start with something really basic because there's so much buzz around future-proofing these days. So what, what is the essential idea of future-proofing? How, how would you define that? Rajiv, would you take that first? Sure. So when you look at some data, um, right, so they say 52% of companies on the Fortune 500 list from the year 2000, 52% uh, of these companies have um, fallen off that list. Right. So in a matter of about 22, 23 years, uh, 250 plus organizations have fallen off that list. Right. And so that begs the question, right, in terms of what went wrong. So it's not like overnight a company ends up becoming a Fortune 500 company. They, they, they spend 20 years to get there. Right. And these are companies that have the deepest pockets. They have the best leadership in town. Uh, they have great brands. They've got loyal customers. They have international presence, distributors, you name it. They've, they've got everything. Uh, technology, right? It's not like they can't spend on technology. They've got that ability as well, right? But then why did 250 companies lose their path? It boils down to perhaps a few things, right? In terms of uh, readiness of people to accept that the, the rules of the game have changed. In other words, they were not future-proof. They were playing by older rules, right? And they were quite successful at that. So it becomes harder to let go of those rules and learn something new. Uh, so that's precisely what has happened. Uh, and so uh, ultimately, when you peel the onion, what you will find is that um, the ability to respond to change, the ability to learn fast and learn and learn fast, those become very pertinent when it comes to future-proofing. Uh, right, so the cost of not future-proofing an organization is irrelevance. Like what has happened to BlackBerry and uh, Blockbuster and a bunch of other companies that were iconic at some stage uh, are irrelevant. So that's the uh, real risk and the cost of not uh, future-proofing an organization. Right, uh, Rituraj, what what's your take on that? How how would you define future-proofing? Uh, I think uh, future proofing requires first for, for us to be able to actually uh, foresee the future uh, you know, beyond uh, what is uh, really visible on the face of it. So what are the kind of trends and patterns that you can see uh, emerging in uh, the coming five years time, let's say? Uh, that ability is not a very common ability. I won't say it's a rare ability, but we get so consumed by our transactions, by our here and now, that we tend to miss out on the real uh, pattern that is emerging out of the 
uh, way things are developing, whether it is on technology front or it is in terms of consumer understanding front or it is in terms of the processes and system, the potential and the latest information talent is having, how talent is actually evolving over a period of time. So we need to be able to foresee future and the way it is going to emerge in the coming five to 10 years time, let's say. That is number one part of future proofing. Number two is, and therefore, what is in it that we need to be doing differently to be able to get there faster, cleaner, better, and uh, really in a more smart or effective manner than uh, others, uh, if uh, one wants to be a little more competitive about it. So future proofing, not only in terms of skills, but also in terms of being able to actually uh, create future in some sense, and therefore be as innovative as possible in terms of really uh, identifying uh, the potential imminent problems that are yet to actually appear as problems and be first ones to be prepared vis-a-vis uh, -vis those problems. So identify future, number one. Number two, actually, therefore be able to find solutions that might seem innovative today, but tomorrow will become norm of the day. And great examples of that have been done by the likes of Netflix. The way Reed Hastings' story goes about the way he went about I know having this small idea of not uh, having had to pay a penalty for uh, you know, delay in return of his uh, cassette that he had uh, uh, taken on rent. Uh, how does one actually make that a real uh, business opportunity and best is for all of us to see? And there are uh, umpteen examples. They are so inspiring of that. Future proofing is not something that is an eclectic uh, term. It is really uh, very much needed for each one of us if we, we want to stay relevant. Otherwise, you will end up actually fighting uh, the you know, obsolescence that uh, you would inevitably end up with. Thanks, Aturaj. I come to my next question, and it is uh, more from the perspective of talent crisis that is going on right now, not just in terms of the great resignation, but also the great retirement of uh, baby boomers that is happening, right? So how important has this entire process of knowledge transfer and business continuity become for organizations? Rajiv, if you can take that one. Yeah, I think this is a front and center for organization, right? On the one hand, as you're saying, uh, in many economies, the baby boomer problem is, is very much there. Uh, when I say baby boomer problem, the issue is there is a missing middle, right? They've got people who have been in the system. They know everything about the system. Uh, right. And, and then there are um, millennials who have joined. When I say millennials, the oldest millennial today is about 40 years old. Uh, right. So there is a, a missing middle that we see here. And once the, the baby boomers sort of retire, they, that's, there's going to be a vacuum. So how do we accelerate this whole uh, knowledge transfer process? Uh, perhaps a lot of companies are looking at um, elements of coaching, mentoring within so that there is the transfer of knowledge that happens. Um, and when it comes to great resignation, um, I think a lot has been said about it. We, we are still trying to understand uh, various facets of uh, what is actually going on. It's very intriguing. Um, so, but essentially it boils down to, I think uh, for people uh, post pandemic, right? Flexibility has become important. Uh, the sense of purpose has become important for some people. It was a rude awakening the last two years, uh, a sense of what am I doing with my career? What am I doing with my life? Right? Is this the right thing that I should be focusing on? Um, and a lot of factors like that have come in. So what, what's the best thing that the organization can do? I think make the um, organization firstly a place to belong. Right? When we feel very disempowered outside, uh, right? With, with the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, you know, surrounding us, and you know, a lot of uh, external factors uh, threatening us, we feel very disempowered. But when you come work at a place, can you? provide that feeling of empowerment. In this place, I belong. I feel empowered. Right? And a lot of that, I think, uh, boils down to leadership, the systems and processes we have, uh, the managerial capabilities, especially in today's context, to uh, deal with things that are operating in a hybrid fashion. Um, I, I suppose a lot of us are not really ready for that. Uh, somewhere we are hoping uh, that we are going to go back to office and everything's going to be back to normal. But uh, the reality could be very different. And so it, this may not be temporary after all. This is probably a new way of working. And so we need to upskill ourselves in terms of how to deal with the, uh, the changing dynamics. So, But the one thing that I think is fundamental is empathy, 
right? That's uh, essentially what people are looking at, be it the baby boomers or the new person joining. We are all going through a lot, and 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 is the organization empathetic? Is that part of the culture, right? And that probably is is the secret sauce for creating that sense of belonging and sense of purpose, camaraderie. And I want to do something good here because I like the organization, I like the people. Uh, that's really beautifully put, Rajiv. Uh, Ritraj, would you like to add anything to what uh, Rajiv said? Yeah, I would love to. In fact, uh, there is something uh, very interesting because I would like to give it a little different color, a little slightly different color. Uh, when you visit a shop or a hotel, you want to feel that you have a sense of belonging to that place. And that's when you feel comfortable and you feel like coming back over there. But in the organization, you need to own it up. And therefore, responsibility on people like me who are actually designing and offering experiences for employees in the organization, we need to know one thing very clearly. We need to find out the purpose and help employees find out their purpose of working and being, of existing. What is that they wish to serve as their purpose in life? Help employees really identify that, number one. Number two, help them actually align at values level with the team, with the department, with the organization as a result. It is very important for you to help your employees know their purpose, know their set of values, four to three values that make them really feel very, very much at their best. And number three, really become part of creating a culture. So um, people like me need to make sure that employees become part of the culture and they contribute to culture rather than actually benefiting, being at the receiving end of the culture called organization. So you create an organization in your mind and not through these seats and tables and air conditioning and uh, infrastructure of the organization. That is uh, one. <clears throat> Number two, it is not really as much only about the uh, organization's uh, ability to get employees up and become their best in the way they are working. And this great resignation or the other terms that are also kind of uh, all around us these days. In my company, for example, we've been hiring you know, for the last 10 years, month after month, and it continues still. We've been hiring anywhere. In hundreds, we've been hiring without really sharing numbers. In hundreds, we've been hiring. And we today exist and operate in more than 100 countries. And uh, overall uh, manpower size is more than 20,000 people. And uh, we are uh, hiring because we are expanding in terms of business. And this is all happening through profitability, obviously. So great resignation may be a fact somewhere, not where uh, we are experiencing, uh, especially in our country, it is more about spotting the right talent, nurturing the talent, and valuing talent to be able to know the strengths of your team members, your employees, and not really look for a dream talent that uh, you don't end up finding anywhere, any life, anyway. So you need to be able to spot talent in your employees and really nurture that, refine that, and help them actually realize their purpose, values, and they start becoming responsible contributors towards culture of the team they are working with. That's my take. Thanks, Ritaraj. That was really insightful. Since we are talking so much about uh, trending words and buzzwords and key phrases, uh, digital transformation is another very buzzing term in the industry. And often it is used as synonymously to uh, uh, future proofing, saying that, you know, if you are, you, if you have done a successful digital transformation, then probably you are future proof. What, what's your take on that, Ritaraj? Yes, I would tend to agree definitely. There is a lot of uh, digital transformation that is uh, as a prerequisite uh, is needed for uh, you to become future proof in, uh, yourself over a period of time on a cons consistent basis. So what do you mean by digital transformation? Each and every single process is under the scanner. It has been under the scanner for us, especially two, three years, all the more so, because thanks to COVID, it has given us those opportunities to reflect upon it and make our operations much leaner, much smarter, and much quicker than ever before. So that means uh, whether it is uh, inventory management or it is working capital flow, 
or it is the way we are actually able to uh, spot opportunities of new molecule to be created, the steps that we are taking in the process research department, the way we can really enhance the speed of uh, our research and development. Each one of these single areas actually require digitalization and transformation around how to make it productive much more than ever before. And uh, it's not enough to have a conversation in form of debate between what a scientist wants and what a businessman wants, and therefore we take time. Scientists would need time. Businessmen would always be impatient to really see results in the day or next morning. Uh, that's fine, all that debate aside. But the fact is that there is a lot of work that is happening. Uh, we have more than a thousand uh, research scientists working on this. But how can their work become much faster? much more yielding, much more productive, at least much more reviewable on a very, very regular basis rather than feeling that, yeah, they will be right at the end of the tunnel one fine morning and we keep waiting for that endlessly. It is not that we are all just waiting for one patent molecule to be created by a company. We are talking about every single step, every small little step of our process actually becoming better than before. And there is therefore a lot of focus on process research and digitalization of that as well. So each one of these aspects and many more, I have just uh, named a few, uh, are being relooked through digital lens and digital transformation is actually helping us become future proof in a better way. Thanks, Sitaraj. Rajiv, how closely would you uh, associate digital transformation and future proof? Yeah, I think it is uh, integral to uh, future proofing because today uh, business models are becoming digital, uh, right? If you talk to pharma companies, they're talking about, you know, on-field sales uh, people, uh, right? Without direct access to doctors, they have to uh, think of a digital way of doing the same thing, right? When digital becomes so fundamental to your selling process, to your buying process, your internal uh, product development uh, process, um, right, so transforming well and making sure that that backbone is well thought out um, and uh, working well without any friction becomes absolutely critical to the organization. As uh, Jeff Bezos would say, right, somebody's friction is the other person's fortune, uh, right? And, and that's what Amazon has done. If you really look at it, they've looked at the whole online shopping process. Wherever there was friction, they removed everything. There's a one click, um, you know, checkout process. So essentially, um, so then digital transformation is all about how do you remove friction and right? how do you automate things where there is inefficiency? How do you do this faster, cheaper, better? And not just about efficiency, it's also about the experience. Ultimately, we know customers want uh, a differentiated personalized experience. And so that's where a lot of innovation also is happening. So I would say um, all of these are fundamental and crucial to an organization's uh, future-proofing strategy. Thanks, Rajiv. So uh, we, we have been talking a lot about the technical, physical, digital aspects of the transformation. But there's psychological aspect to it as well, right? Where, where mind shift uh, plays a very important role in developing that culture of uh, future proofing or being ready uh, for the future, right? So how important is that to ensure that you are on a proactive mode rather than a reactive mode? But Rajiv, if you would like to. Sure, know. sure. So when, when I think of uh, digital transformation, I think in terms of three broad pillars, right? One is uh, strategy, right? What, what What is this being used for? Sometimes, you know, we get ahead of ourselves. We want to call everything AI, ML, sometimes needlessly so. So, um, so that uh, is very essential to uh, align our digital strategy and align it with the business strategy. Is it serving the purpose or not? The second element is capabilities. Right. So it's one thing to have a nice PowerPoint deck which says this is our brand new 2025 digital strategy, but do we have the capabilities for it? And in many traditional organizations, that is a challenge. How do I attract digital ready talent to the organization? They would rather work for a Google or Amazon, but how do I get those people to work for a traditional firm? Right. So there is a lot of capability related uh, issues that one needs to think about. And how do I build versus buy versus uh, borrow, that's uh, the gig economy. And they, they say there's a fourth B in talent management, which is all about bots, right? Build, borrow, um, buy and bots, uh, right? And so having a good strategy around that, that's all centered around capabilities. The third element is culture, of course, right? So 
uh, even if I hire the best brains from uh, Google and Amazon and all of these places, can I have them all aligned on what the mission is for the organization? That's the, the how will we get stuff done? And that's the cultural aspect. And many things that you spoke about in terms of the mindset, um, right? All of that boils down to daily interactions, right? How are decisions being made? What are the processes? What are we uh, prioritizing in our, in our business? So that's where I think mindsets get demonstrated, right? And that's a very essential um, element. And going back to what I started with, right? 52% companies becoming irrelevant, by and large is a mindset issue where people thought I've arrived, I'm invincible, I cannot be pushed out of the pedestal and we saw what happened. So somewhere I think uh, humility is important as well to say, I don't know, we'll figure out, right? For a leading company to say, I don't know, I suppose that's a challenge, uh, right? And so those are fundamentally things that have to change from a people's standpoint. So Ritraj, I'll come to you next. Uh, and it is in context to COVID-19, which was like a watershed uh, event in uh, multiple aspects, right? And we realize that disruption can come in any form, right? So how do organizations actually prepare for something they probably aren't even aware of, right? Especially from the mindset and attitude point of view. Great question, uh, I must say, uh, because it uh, helps me uh, you know, shed some light on some of these very important things that we discovered over the last three years in this organization, number one people are uh, much more ready than we would imagine them to be. Uh, this generation of uh, employees that we are hiring, that we are uh, seeing finding around us, they have actually much greater sense and appetite for adventure. And when I say adventure, I mean growth-related adventure. So they would like to deal with uncertainty in a much more positive way, much more of an optimist outlook is the, uh, that we were experienced from employees. Our job has been very importantly to make sure that we keep the systems sane and responsiveness is uh, at its best in such moments of uh, ambiguity when we have COVID kind of situation. Very important for us to really generate as many cross-functional projects as possible. It is very therefore critical for us to know that you know, how do you nurture talent also? How do you build capabilities for future proofing also helps uh, gets help when you have a lot of cross-functional projects happening. And these cross-functional projects need not necessarily mean only from the dimension of multiple functions. It also means from the dimension of multiple hierarchies as well as multiple, uh, multiple profiles. So people who are beyond uh, 40 are getting to work with people who are just in their early 20s or even beyond 50 are getting to work with early 30s kind of uh, thing. That gives you a lot of learning mutually on both sides. So there is no senior junior in that. There's very, very democratically everybody at the same level. How we've been able to actually make it work very uh, smoothly in uh, COVID times has been, we have created opportunities for a lot of cross-functional collaboration. We also created opportunities where we have got people to lead regardless of, so uh, we don't confuse influence with authority. Anybody can have that influence. And we were uh, talking about influence with Rajiv in the rapid fire. So we have found a lot of opportunity like this, a simple process like every single employee reporting his or her welfare through some set of 10 questions on his mobile every morning. And we created immediately a platform that gave a tremendous sense of bonding, belongingness, as well as sense to employee that though I am far away from physical office, but this organization cares for me. So I'm just giving one example of instant cross-functional collaboration projects uh, coming up in this moment of so-called crisis. Come to think of it, nothing as crisis. It's all only opportunity, a little different words. Uh, same thing that Rajiv just quoted, Jeff, it's also far. Thanks, Raj. Okay, so uh, Rajiv, uh... Data is something which is uh, cutting across functions and organizations and uh, professionals in whatever capacities they are working for the organization. So in that sense, data literacy has become pretty essential. How, how do you see uh, database decision-making and operating in a data-driven uh, environment becoming an essential skill for organizations irrespective of uh, their background? 
Great. So uh, that's a fantastic question again. So um, I would just rephrase it slightly differently. Um, I'm not a big fan of data driven as a phrase. Uh, it's data enabled. The reason why I emphasize that is there is some value to human ingenuity as well. Uh, right. So when you say data driven, it seems like everything is driven by data. Um, I that is not the the vision for the future that I have at least. Um, so it, it's a it's a hybrid world where human ingenuity comes hand in hand with uh, insightful data, and that's when insights happen. So um, on the topic of data itself, uh, right? So they say data is a new oil. Some people say data is a new soil. Data is a new oxygen. Um, so the metaphors are are many. But I think what everybody is trying to say is if oil was uh, the raw material for the industrial age, many wars have been fought because of oil, right? And that was the, the and continues to be even now, uh, right? But today, data uh, it has gained so much prominence, right? In fact, if you think about the largest companies in the world today, based on market cap, you will find database platforms, right? Uh, you, you'll find a Google and Amazon, a Facebook. Microsoft, right? End of the day, they are thriving on data. So uh, I, I think it's no surprise then, you know, data and skills relating to data um, have become very important, cannot be ignored anymore. Uh, just like um, uh, literacy in general in the industrial age, the ability to read and write and the able, numerical literacy, the ability to add numbers and deal with numbers were crucial in the uh, industrial age. In the digital age, the ability to deal with data becomes fundamental so that's why we are talking in terms of literacy when you say literacy it, it seems like very something very basic but that's where we are um, many organizations um, uh, find themselves wanting in terms of they have all the data in the world uh, right access to the data is there but the ability to look at it and and create value out of it right uh, perhaps has not been uh, that effective so uh, to me data literacy is a foundational skill and something that uh, pretty much everyone all of us in fact I'm sure can do a little bit more when it comes to data. Great points there, Raji. Vitraj, what's, what's your take on that? Oh, there's a long, long way for each one of us to go on that front. In fact, uh, I, in fact, briefly touched upon it uh, a little while earlier as well. There is so much of data getting generated at every moment in uh, operations, whether it is in manufacturing, quality, sales and marketing, research development, support functions, there is humongous amount of data getting generated. There is some sense of perspective that we need to build, like very beautifully quoted by, uh, I'm quoting and said by Albert Einstein once was that true science, true sign of intelligence is not knowledge, but imagination. So can we imagine actually, what is the kind of data we need for this moment for the decision that we are wanting to take? Do we have that understanding? If we know that, then we would access data. Not every time it is actually a question of number crunching or algorithm to be put uh, on data, and then we uh, draw and make data more beneficial. Are we able to connect what is happening, sequence that around? So what do we need to uh, look at as data to be able to understand that? Let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say. For example, if we know that in an organization, there are three sets of uh, approvals needed for a particular process to be uh, approved uh, for expense or cash payout. So are those three sets of, uh, those three steps actually uh, yielding the desired benefit or have they actually outlived their purpose or do they need to be even now made more stringent? Does that review require some data and what is the kind of data we need for that so that we make the ability to make our organization much leaner, smarter, and agile, much more agile, we need to have a better data input from this time. So this perspective first to be able to connect what we need to achieve and towards that, what is the kind of data that we need to identify and figure out? We need to have that understanding first. And then really working with data is not as much of a difficulty. What we confuse data literacy as a term many times with is is data mining, data analysis, data management, but it is more so in some context of the desired intent we have that we need to be very robust and clear about is my take on this. That's beautifully put. If I may add, um, you know, they say um, a fool with a tool is still a fool. 
uh, right? So when presented with a lot of data, if the mind that is looking at the data is not sharp enough, the data doesn't do anything by itself, right? Uh, so I think somewhere uh, critical thinking becomes important to Ritraj's point, point as well. Why are we using this data? To what end, right? What are we trying to solve? And, and then what is the right data to look at? So those are, I think, um, you know, critical thinking skills that are needed. Perhaps uh, that's the foundation on which, you know, data literacy can even be thought of. Thanks, Rajiv and Vitraj. We now come to the last question, and it pertains to the role of leadership in ensuring organizations' uh, future proofing, especially at a time when uh, leaders are also undergoing a lot of change and transformation themselves. How are they managing that? Rajiv, if you can take that one. First. So I, I think there is a lot on leaders' uh, shoulders today. I, I think that's uh, rightly put. Uh, so it is not just digital that's disrupting today. You, ha you have healthcare disruption happening uh, last two years. Um, there is climate-based in some countries. That's a big one, uh, right? So, so the problems that you're dealing with today are not small anymore. Yes, there are a lot of small issues. They continue to exist. But there are some massive ones as well for which answers are not very clear, right? And, and, and when I think back, you know, I've attended many conferences. I'm sure all of us have. Uh, where we uh, used to speak about the VUCA world. And at that time, I don't think we even understood what that was. Of course, we understood what it meant, but we hadn't experienced it. But the last two years has given us a taste of what it truly is, um, right? And so uh, it's not a theoretical construct anymore. It's an e experiential reality for us. So yes, there is a lot on uh, leaders from an outside perspective. You know, in many um, countries today, there is hyperinflation going on. Um, you know, even in India, when I talk to uh, leaders in the cement industry, um, right, they're talking about the Russia-Ukraine war, which has completely disrupted their supply chain um, and uh, raw material costs going up. So there is a lot that is happening externally, right, even without digital and other things, right. And on top of that, there is an internal transformation that's going on where you need to cheerlead, you need to role model, you need to uh, basically be the champion for your values and find a path through this maze, right? So, uh, so there is a lot going on today. You're mm -hmm. right about that. So I think, um, what is the antidote to that? What do leaders have to do? Um, yeah, nothing prescriptive. I think we're all trying to figure it out um, as we speak. But uh, what works for me is uh, sort of developing the true north, uh, clarity on what needs to be done, uh, right? And so uh, separating the signal from the noise, as they say. There's a lot of noise in the ecosystem, but... Uh, being very clear on what I will focus on, what I will not focus on. And also this uh, influence again comes back because what is it that you can truly influence, right? Uh, forget the rest because that's, there's anyway, that's a no op as they saw, say in uh, semiconductor industry, right? You cannot do anything about it. So look at what is in your control and do your best there, um, right? So I'm, I, I guess I'm going back to the basics and that's what I guess uh, a crisis environment also teaches you, right? When there's so much going on, Make it simple, keep it simple, go back to the basics, see what makes you tick, double down on that. Thanks, Rajiv. Rituraj, your perspective on that? Leaders uh, need to, of <clears throat> course, uh, one of the most important things for uh, leaders to do is that they should not become the bottleneck and therefore they should only provide opportunities uh, for the employees to bring out their best. So what are the steps for that? Number one, of course, employees, like I shared earlier, need to be allowed to uh, uh, define their own or find out their own purpose. What is the purpose? Why they are working? It's uh, fine what they have to do and how they have to do, but why should I do that? Uh, so that purpose I need to be able to know for myself and employees to be able to see an alignment between their own personal values and the values that the organization is actually talking about in action as well. And number three is obviously leaders need to continuously appreciate good work happening on spot, on the spot. And it's not really uh, only at the end of the year through increments and promotions. It's got to be on the go every time. It's not only for leaders to appreciate, but leaders to generate a very safe environment, safe zone for people to appreciate each other, for peer group appreciation to go as noticed, as highly noticed as the appreciation that happens from top to bottom. So leaders need to actually offer so much of trust and so much of opportunity to employees to bring out their best. And employees, this generation is definitely much smarter than what leaders would actually dread. Uh, they are far more in terms of giving you back 
productivity, uh, surprise, pleasant surprise of output, and take, raising the bar much higher. But it has to be a work based on a lot of uh, opportunities being provided to them in terms of growth, uh, challenges being thrown at them, in terms of uncertainty management being entrusted with them, in terms of they being roped in a lot of cross-functional collaboration assignments that actually help us navigate through these troubled times of all kinds that we see, whether it is war or it is COVID or it is any such uh, thing that might appear and hit us in future also. Leaders have to be only opportunities provider, system provider, and a complete environment builder and rest they need to actually let the next gen take over. Thanks a lot, Rituraj. Thank you, Raji. We come to the end of uh, this uh, theme-based discussion. Uh, it was so enriching and so insightful. Thank you so much for that. But as is customary with the knowledge show, we don't let our guests go uh, without a short round of first impression game, right? Because we are not strangers anymore. Uh, and, and the way we share things, we form a perception of uh, the other person, right? So based on your first impression, we have formed this game. So Rituraj, I would turn to you first uh, for this segment. Based on your first impression, which of the following statements about Rajiv is true? So I'll give you three statements, only one is true. Okay. Rajiv is a movie producer and a theater artist. Second, Rajiv is a practicing astrologer. Third, Rajiv owns a cafe restaurant in Goa. Rajiv owns a cafe restaurant in Goa. That according to you is true. Yeah. Rajiv, would you like to share no, something? I, I don't own one. I, I think I'll add it to my bucket list though. It's it's exciting um, <laughs> to, to just hear that. Um, the actual right answer here is um, option one. Uh, so I, I've Ooh. acted, uh, done many theater shows. Uh, yeah, so that's the right answer. Oh, good to know that. <laughs> I took a guess, but good to know this. It was news for me also. I was going through his profile and I realized, okay, wow. Yeah, so at some point in time, I actually took it very seriously. And I wanted to branch out and go mainstream on theater, but uh, but here I am. Good to know. Thanks, Pitraj. Uh, Rajiv, we'll come to you. Uh, based on your first impression of Pitraj, which of the following statements is true about him? Rituraj was working with Intel before Lupin. Rituraj started his career in finance. Rituraj has a bachelor's degree in chemistry. Which one of these is true about Rituraj? Uh, so maybe completely off here, but something tells me that he had something to do with chemistry. Uh, yeah, that would be my guess. Wow. <laughs> I, I, Hold on. Okay. How did you get that one correct? Uh, it's a random thing, right? So in terms of uh, his association with uh, Lupin, I don't know, uh, pharma, chemical, I don't know. I, the... But that's not entri entirely true because Itraj was in a different sector before Lupin, if I'm not wrong. Okay. That's right. I was with IBM before Lupin. Ah, okay. So you did have a high-tech, uh, you know, okay, cool. Yeah, so I, I think time to book my ticket to Las Vegas or something. Uh, luck is <laughs> <in the market. laughs> Great. Uh, I had a lot of fun talking to both of you on this show. Thanks for your time. And thank you so much for sharing your insights and experiences and anecdotes with us. I thank had you. a lot of fun, Amal. Thanks a lot for inviting me and look forward to seeing this go live uh, whenever it is. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed it as well. And Ritraj, as I said at the starting of uh, uh, this whole show, I've, I've always uh, looked up to you in terms of insights and the clarity with which you are able to articulate things. And, and today was no exception either. I, I, you, I, I learned a lot. Uh, thank you so much for this experience. Ditto here, Rajiv. It's been a pleasure every time I've interacted with you on different forums and look forward to many more similar interactions. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. You, Bye. Have a good day. Good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.